In this way of looking at things, the, the history of the last 10,000 years has been one giant arms race. Welcome back to Mind Matters. I'm Harrison Cayley, joined by Elan Martin, Adam Daniels, and Luke Koch. Today, we are going to talk about this book, Ultra Society by Peter Turchin. We did a show on another of Peter Turchin's works. I believe it was Ages and Chaos, or and maybe just some of his articles too. Um, and secular Cycles. Yeah, so on, I think the show, yeah, the show had Clio Dynamics in the, in the title. It's actually one of our more popular shows at the time. And really cool book. He has a history. He was actually like uh, an evolutionary scientist originally doing like models of population growths and and something like that. And he kind of shifted over into sociology, um, history, and applying his kind of rigorous statistical and like mathematical models to um, f phenomena of society. So ages and chaos was, or no, no, ages of discord, not ages, that's Velikovsky. <laughs> ages of discord was, uh, his book on American history and the, and the two secular cycles in, in American history and, um, kind of a popular account laying out the, just all of the kind of data that goes into his structural demographic analysis of like, essentially the rise and fall of societies, the, the secular cycles that they go through. And that accounts for such things as um, population growth, population decline, um, an increase in like societal immiseration. So, um, you know, lack of um, quality of life, spending power. Um, and then associated with this are also rises in um, like political polarization and political violence. And then near the end of these of these cycles, in the, like the so-called uh, stagflation periods of these cycles, you find this overgrowth of what he calls um, oh, what's his word for them? The il in, uh, well, there's intra-elite competition. So what you have is this this rise in the the population of you know potential elites, people that want to want to move up into the upper classes. So, you know, in, in the U.S., um, not only the U.S., but um, this is the way it works in the U.S., is if you want to get into the ruling class of the U.S., you pretty much need a law degree. It's one of the one of the kind of ways that, uh, one of the professions that have been associated with the ruling class for like, you know, almost all of America's history. But so you have this, a whole bunch of people that want to enter the, the elite class, but there's too many of them. And so then you have this intra elite competition where they're competing with each other and all of these things kind of come together to, to really raise the, the political stress index. And that's the point at which, um, that's kind of the crisis point. That's the point at which you can have revolution, state collapse, um, you know, major wars, um, economic, economic collapse, just all kinds of destruction. So these are this. This is his kind of scientific take on on this phenomenon of these cycles in history that have been recognized for at least scientifically for you know the past 150 years or more. But you know, going back to the you know the Greeks had these notions of of um, cycles of of history and society. So he. He's created, along with a whole bunch of colleagues, this database. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's a it's an Egyptian named after an Egyptian god. Uh, I think it was like the Egyptian goddess of record keeping or something like that, Seshat or Seshat. And so that's the name of his database, where they've just they they've got tons of data going back as far as possible for like all different regions of the of the globe, population data, economic data, um, just tons and tons of, of data to then crunch, like numbers to crunch, to then test theories about how, how societies develop and how they like shrink and grow and, and rise and decline. And so this book is subtitled, How 10,000 Years of War Made Humans the Greatest Cooperators on Earth. And it's, I think the inspiration for this book was an article that Turchin wrote sometime before it was published. So this book was published in like 2015, 2016. 
And I think the paper that he wrote came out in 2015. Basically, he was testing some of his ideas using all these um, all this data in the database. And about the the growth of large scale large scale complex societies. So what contributes to that? Because there are many theories. You know, there are some theories, um, like especially popular ones, is that agriculture agriculture is the the main driver of the you know the growth of and rise of large civilizations, large states. And this has to do with like you you have now you have with an agricultural setting you now have the ability like with uh, with cities to have a a greater productive capacity that frees up um, frees up individuals to develop other things and that that the main driver would be like um, would be agriculture <clears throat> and associated with this these are a few of the ideas that he kind of combats um, because associated with this. With this is also the, this hypothesis of the decline in violence over the past 10,000 years, something that Steven Pinker has written about in his book, uh, Better, Angel, Better Angels of Our Nature. And so another of these theories is that, um, well, uh, Pinker kind of presents a bunch of theories for, for why violence has declined um, in, certain, in certain ways over certain periods of time. And Turchin agrees with him on some areas, but Pinker's kind of Pinker kind of just threw together his best guesses. You know, oh, it's it pro- it's probably a combination of these five or six things that contributed to the rise of, or to the decline of violence. And Turchin kind of um, goes through Pinker's analyses and says, well, no, this isn't right. This isn't right. This really isn't right. Well, this one's kind of right. And using using his data driven approach comes to the conclusion that it's primarily warfare. Um, well, in the, in the subtitles, you have the two main things here, war and cooperation. He starts the book with this um, kind of an overview of, of one aspect of human co- cooperation, and these are the large-scale projects that humans can engage in. So you look back at the, the first... Um, like in the archaeological record, the first large-scale cooperative endeavors that we can see in um, in human history are like the the um, the megaliths. So, for for instance, like Stonehenge, or before that, in Turkey, you have um, like Çatalhöyük and what's the other one? Gobekli the more, Tepe. Yeah, Gobekli Tepe. And so these are are massive projects that require um, a lot of people working together. To do them, and then you have like the great mounds in in the Americas, in uh, especially in North America. Well, both, but but there's this one in North America that he talks about. <clears throat> I can't remember which one it what it is or where it was. It starts with a P. Yeah, but but it's uh, it's this big mound, and you know there were theories that oh it must have taken you know this many people this many years to do it. You know all all gathering <clears throat> gathering soil and and putting it together and raising it up, and but then there. Um, someone did a. Someone decided to test out, do a little test on it, and like took a slice, took a, a sample of the of the entire you know henge or or mound, and through analysis of the way the the layering of the of the the dirt was, concluded that it must have been it must have the entire thing must have been constructed between two rainfalls, like it didn't rain for the entire period that this thing was constructed, so it didn't take years and years and years to build. There were like thousands of people cooperating to build this thing in like um, maybe at most a month, you know, maybe a couple of weeks. But then he compares that if you move to the present with like the International Space Station and the amount of cooperation that that required, not only between nations, but you, you need all these types, all these industries um, like cooperating and basically the, the ability of uh, the ability to coordinate and utilize all of these um all these industries to create something that is like, you know, extremely technologically advanced, you know, compared to a mound. And so there has been this rise in the ability uh, and scale of human cooperation over the, over the generations. And that is reflected in population size. So you have these giant populations of these massive countries, you know, like uh, Russia, 160 million, like the U S 333 million, something like that. China, one point, six billion, something like that. And previously, um, if you look at tribal societies, like the, your tribe was in the hundreds up to maybe low thousands. And then you had early, um, like chiefdoms, which had like maybe, 
you know, maybe five to 10,000, something like that. Then, you know, then you had the, the archaic states, which were maybe, I think, 100,000. Um, let, me, let me just check. I don't want to give misinformation here. Yeah, so simple chiefdoms were in the thousands. Complex chiefdoms were in the 10,000s. Archaic states were in the hundreds of thousands, and then you get into the millions, the ten millions of the of the mega empires, and then the hundred hundreds of millions in the the modern uh, large nation states, and so you have this. Is this kind of like a? It's an exponential or logarithmic? I don't know my math of growth of you know from tens to hundreds to thousands to ten thousands, and then you look at the time scale, and you know over the past, you know it it took essentially. Um, you know, 200,000 years to get to the hundreds of thousands, and then 5,000 years to get from hundreds of thousands to hundreds of millions. So, you know, population sizes have just um, ex exploded, um, relatively speaking. But the main driver of this, Turchin argues, is warfare and military technology. And so his book is, is kind of a, um, a history of the last 10,000 years and a, and a history of warfare and a history of human co cooperation. I, I guess, you know, if I could summarize the thesis of the book in as few words as possible, it would be something like warfare inspires cooperation and um, what's the, what would be the second part of that? Cooperation, well, also inspires the, the warfare, but I, I don't know how exactly to describe that yet. I can't. I can't remember the like the the most precise way to put it, but for example, when you have a, a giant state that is internally cooperating to a large degree, like living at peace with itself, then you have an even uh, even more resources and potential to create more military technologies and to expand even more, and then that creates conflict and co and competition with all the other states, like on the periphery, that it may engage in conflicts with and then that inspires them to 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 match their military technology it's basically like the entire the, the in this way of looking at things the the history of the last 10,000 years has been one giant arms race you know it hasn't it wasn't just the 20th century with the um you know in the cold war with the with the Ruskies with this uh it's just that the technology military technology got to the point where of mutually assured destruction but that's kind of been the dynamic of the the entirety of, of human history. And well, we can get into details, but that's a, that's a broad overview. Um, yeah. Did you guys have any comments on that or, or questions? And I can get into some details cause I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, you guys haven't read the whole book. Some, just, uh, some things about it and things like that, but what kind of stuff did you guys find? Uh, I got four chapters in. Um, so I got through, most of the the chapter, I think all of the chapter on sports, and then, uh, yeah. So cooperate to compete. Yeah. So there was a couple of interesting things. Uh, well, there's a lot of interesting things, and in they're just the idea of the uh, creative and destructive power of war, uh, and the way that he frames it is a totally new conception of. Of how to look at why history has unfolded in the way that it has. Uh, and it is a very, I think, good means to kind of explain why, uh, you know, nations have risen and fallen or, or tribes have risen and fallen. It's uh, this, this external pressure, which fosters intercommunal or intertribal or intra-tribal, so within the tribe itself, cooperation, um, which then, you know, allows for more effective uh, extra group, uh, you know, destruction, uh, which then, you know, because you take over their land and their resources or even their people and their technologies, you can then incorporate that to become even more cohesive uh, and stronger. Um, and just how important... Uh, and so the other thing with that is the uh, the cooperator's dilemma and how cooperation is so essential uh, in all of these various things. But there's the dilemma of the thing that's good for the group, you know, costs the private individual or the actual individual something. So the individual must sacrifice for the good of the whole. And so it's all of these 
various balancing acts, um, you know, because each person is not just a member of a nation, but they're also a member of, uh, you know, a family unit, uh, maybe even like a guild of some kind. And each of these different levels of the society has very similar dynamics to the the state level of, you know, intra intrastate cooperation and external pressures. The same thing can happen to or goes on with all of these various different institutions of sorts where there's the better there is or the more internal cohesion and cooperation, the more effective they are at doing whatever it is that they're trying to do. Um, and so when you see the the groups um, becoming less and less cooperative, well, that's where uh, things tend to fall apart. And that's actually another interesting point that he raises about how there is the the nature of cooperation is fickle. It's it's very sensitive, I guess you'd say. Like peace is a very fragile thing. fragile thing. It's not when you look at history, peace is not the norm. Peace is like the uh, exception to the rule almost. Um, and so it 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 makes sense then that when you talk about how things can devolve, it's like, it's not really how do things de devolve, it's more like, how do things kind of like get to where you can cooperate to such a, a large extent? It's kind of like flipping it on its, yeah. it's very, on its head. Very Petersonian, you know, that's that's pretty much Peterson's perspective that he that he shares in a lot of his lectures is he's always, it's always remarkable to him how well things work and how people get along and that, that we, you know, he gives the example of in a, in a lecture, in a, in a, with a big audience, you know, it's amazing that we're all sitting here being nice to each other and not rip ripping each other's throats out. And I'll just think about that for a minute. And it's a bit of an exaggeration, um, because cooperation has cooperation, like you said, you know, it, it's, it has been part of human nature forever, but the parameters of that cooperation have shifted and changed over time. And one of the, I think the thing that, that, Peterson is noticing is has to do with that large scale cooperation. Like here are a bunch of strangers who don't know each other, don't share families, don't share tribes. And, um, and here we are all cooperating. Whereas, you know, uh, 10,000 years ago or like 8,000 years ago, that wouldn't be the case. That just wouldn't be possible. The, the institutions didn't exist. The, the precedents didn't exist. And, and you had these small groups that were wary of each other, like strangers were stranger for strangers for a reason, and they were at the very least potential enemies. So one of the interesting things on that point that was, you know, I had some idea of, but it didn't really it didn't have the details to really make it hit home. And that was the the nature of violence in like uh, tribal uh, well, the nature of intertribal warfare, put it that way. So he, he's got some accounts for, from like North America and, and then some st statistical information about like tribal societies and the violent death rate in tribal societies. Cause there's this idea that, you know, all tribal societies were peaceful and there was relatively little violence and that, um, that, uh, life was just so much better in, in tribal societies and probably that was probably influenced a lot by like uh, Rousseau, <clears throat> his ideas of the noble savage, but it really actually isn't true. Now it may have been <clears throat> it may have been true in Paleolithic, Paleolithic times, um, and Turchin Turchin doesn't talk about Paleolithic times, um, so like pre twelve thousand BC, you know, so like thirty thousand years ago when they were um, you know painting uh, painting all the wall art and you know, France and Spain, um, a slightly different situation there just because, uh, well, at least from his perspective and according to, you know, current scientific ideas of the, of the nature of those times that populations were so small and base and basically didn't have much contact with each other. But regardless of that, from like, from 12,000 to like introduction of agriculture in various places, in the, in the period prior to the introduction of agriculture, the death rates were as much as like dozens to hundreds of times higher than they are in any state in existence today. 
um, murder rates were higher, like so that would be within tribe murder rates, and then just the nature of of tribal warfare, which was almost constant for for these tr- tribal societies. So, well, I mean, it was pretty common. Now, this won't be much of a surprise, but it was pretty common, like an intertribal warfare for, um, you know, for one tribe to come in, um, attack the other tribe, kill all of the males. Um, so any males that were captured were then tortured, you know, maybe skinned, um, you know, flayed, um, scalped, um, burned alive. And they also had uh, the women and children participating. That was a, another thing that kind of stuck out in terms of like the noble savage has like their women and children engaging in like the torturing and disemboweling of the, of the, you know, captured prisoners. Like yeah. that's, that's. Oof. Yeah, the women and children would be enslaved or, well, enslaved, you know, incorporated into the new tribe. That was just the way things were done back then. And uh, wait until we get to the archaic states, because the archaic states were were pretty um, uh, good movie material. And yeah, so the, I mean, the, the any any time they have remains available, archaeological, you know, remains of, you know, burial grounds or just, uh, you know, skeletons that they can find, you know, a, a a significant portion of of them uh, died violent deaths, and so warfare um, was just pretty much a constant. And you can see this progress the, the way the way that I picture it in my mind this progression over time is that you know in tribal societies you have these small tribes you know you can represent each tribe as a little circle. No, I won't. Oh, oops. <laughs> this each, you know, so you have various circles, and on the peripheries, you know, those are the war, those are the battles. Now, the the circles are so small that uh, you know you have one battle, and poof, and then that tribe is pretty much destroyed, either you know, either killed or integrated into the new tribe. That tribe gets a bit bigger, maybe, and then that that process just happens over time till till the point where you get these giant circles, and the wars on the periphery. You know, the war is no longer these tiny circles that just encapsulate each other like, you know, uh, like some kind of amoebas, but these giant structures where the warfare is on the periphery. And meanwhile, on the inner part of the circle, on the geographical area of this um, chiefdom or this archaic state or this empire or this megastate, everyone's getting along within the, within the borders of that region, within that polity. And so that's... So you, the the circle of cooperation has gotten larger and larger. So, and what do you mean? Okay, so what do we actually mean by cooperation? Well, in a tribe, everyone more or less gets along. Of course, there there will be upstarts and free riders who might be um, shunned, exiled, or you know ostracized or murdered if they become too much of a problem for the tribe. But everyone else is pretty much getting along and cooperating for the survival of the tribe. They're not at war with each other. They're at war with other tribes. And the same thing applies to um, states for the most part, is that you look at, you know, any, any modern state, pretty much everyone gets along. They cooperate with each other, they trade with each other, um, and there isn't this constant state of warfare within, within the state itself. But there's still warfare on the peripheries, on the borders. And it's that, it, it's that dynamic that that contributes not only to the to the growth of the state. Well, I'll, I'll go through some some of how this how this plays out. So you've got these motivations. Well, I'll start from the beginning. We'll go backwards. So starting with the the hunter gatherers, you can kind of hypothesize an early history where people like hunted on their own. Maybe maybe they never did that, but just you know you do it as a thought experiment you can catch like a rabbit some birds you know some small game on your own what it takes to take down like a woolly mammoth is a a group of hunters working together and cooperating with each other and this is how hunting was done you know in these tribal groups is that everyone was the hunters were cooperating to take down this large game because when you take down a a large animal that feeds everyone and you know, not just yourself, and you have more than you need, so you can so you share it. This was the dynamic. This was like the egalitarian uh, dynamic within tribes: is that everyone got fed. But you need a, an effective 
fighting force, you need an effective hunting group in order to do the hunting. And if you have a free rider, like a guy who, who's like, well, I'm just going to let everyone else hunt, you know, I'm just going to go off and do my own thing. That's going, that's not going to go well with the, the hunting group because someone's not pulling their weight. So there's going to be repercussions for that individual. So you have this within the, like the domain of hunting, you have this, this pressure to, to establish a, a cooperative uh, spirit among these hunting groups. Now, hunting is not much different than warfare. So the first people engaged in warfare, well, what's an army? It's a group of people who are cooperating to fight another group who are cooperating. And if one group is terrible at cooperating and everyone wants to do their own thing and, you know, um, go for glory and be the, the, the top guy on the, on the battlefield, they're going to get wiped out by an, a, a cooperative uh, military, a cooperative fighting group. And so you've got several motivations going on. You, if you want to survive in this type of environment, first of all, you have to be good at cooperating. You have to have, you have to have a, a um, well, the, just a cooperative atmosphere within your own group, within your own tribe to, to be able to withstand and uh, either defend against, well, we'll go with defense, to be able to defend against an invasion from another tribe. You have to be able to cooperate and fight and you have to have the weapons to do so. Now, if you're, if you, if you're really paranoid or just smart, what's the, what's the next best thing besides just weapons? It's more bodies, more people. You want a bigger army. So what do you do? You establish alliances. You, get, you establish a bigger polity, a bigger um, pool from which to draw warriors that will then cooperate in the defense of the tribe or the offense against other tribes. And so this in, uh, this inspires or, you know, promotes the growth of the population size, because you want a bigger, you want a bigger group in order to be able to better, better uh, protect yourself and to sustain your tribe. Otherwise you might be done. And that's kind of a basic dynamic that has played out, Turchin argues, over, over the past 10,000 years. If we skip forward ahead a bit to um, like the the step warriors, the horse, the the, the 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 warriors on horseback from the Eurasian step, you know. So these were guys that were um, expert, you know, archers and and horseback riders, and they were unstoppable, you know, for the time that they were from the time of their emergence. I think that was like in the second millennium BC. So in like the 2000, uh, in the 1000s BC, maybe the 2000s BC, can't, can't remember if it was, if it went that far back, but there was a, an enormous pressure to defend against these steppe warriors. And that arguably inspired the, um, the rise of the first empires. Um, so you have the first empires springing up in Persia, um, the Achaemenid, Achaemenid, I don't know how to pronounce the, that one, the Han dynasty in China. Um, you have the, um, the Roman empire that came shortly after in the, you know, in the first, first millennium. Yeah. First millennium BC. And, um, so you have these like four or five major empires that spring up, um, in response to this, uh, this threat from the steppe warriors who were just mowing down everyone that was in their path. They, they had the superior military technology, technology of the day. And so what do you then find? You find other groups, other um, other states, other empires, then adopting that technology, because when someone else gets a, uh, gets a, a leg up on you uh, in, in regards to military technology, well, then you have to um, adopt that technology to order in order to be, a, uh, well, to have that advantage and ideally also to develop better defensive capabilities. So this dynamic has been playing out for 10,000 years. And so, um, well, Going back again to those tribal societies, you had this these growth this this growth of the the level of societal organization from these early tribes that could have been like I said hundreds up to maybe maybe thousands to these uh, chiefdoms and these complex chiefdoms, so these um, these alliances. Um, so you have these tribal alliances between various tribes who all kind of um, you know agree kind of like a modern military alliance, but between very small groups. Uh, well, relatively small groups. And then come the archaic states. Now this is, well, first, one of the things that, that I 
that was kind of cool that stuck out to, to me is that there have been, you know, ver various theories on um, like the the stages of civilization, the stages of societies over the past, or you know, over the centuries. So um, I can't remember any of the big names, the big the big guys who came up with their theories. But you know, you have like you know barbarism and you know or you know primitive something and barbarism, and then slowly you get you know religion, or, or then then you become uh, then you become actually civilized, and so you have this set kind of these set levels of civilization that you go through. And there's actually something similar in in this pre in Turchin's presentation, but it's determined primarily by population size. So it seems that it seems that population sizes, um, once they get a certain, you know, to a certain level with a certain level of organization, there are certain similarities between the between these um, comparable groups, these comparable polities. And it's not like, oh, in the five thousands societies were like this. And then in the in the first century, they were like this. And then in the 15th century, they were like this. Well, it depends because at various places across the planet, there were different um, different levels going on. So everything becomes intermixed. Like even until, um, well, he describes the um, uh, Hawaiian state in like the 1700s, right? Or was it 17 or 1800s? I think it was the 1700s. Was it 18? 18. 1800s? And, you know, what Hawaiian society was like when, you know, the, the, the Europeans, the Americans or whoever, you know, first got over there and took over the place. And, um, and so that was arguably Hawaii was at the level of an archaic state at that time. And the first arch archaic states cropped up about 5,000 years ago in like Mesopotamia and Egypt. And so you had these archaic states and then even in the, you know, up until the probably even the 1900, the 1900s, you had areas, maybe it was late 1800s, I can't remember. You had areas in like, um, I can't remember if it was New Guinea, um, but these isolated areas of, of tribes that, that had, because of the, the nature of the geography, like the people on the coast had no idea that these people actually existed inland. They, they thought that it was, um, you know, that there were, they just assumed that it was just mountains and trees back there, but they couldn't get there because it was so um, um, just difficult to difficult to get there. They'd never they'd never made the journey in, but once they were actually found, they discovered all these these tribes that had, you know, just presumably been li been living like they'd been living for thousands and thousands of years. And very interestingly, it's like he he describes their the the way they worked. I think there were something like I don't know 30, 30 different tribes or something, but they in, engaged in constant. Um, like uh, constant warfare and ritual warfare, so they'd they'd have these these ritual combats with each other, and um, even though it was ritual combat, there was still a real combat as well. So uh, there's just some very interesting details about how they actually um, how they actually fought and engaged in combat with each other, and um, but it was there it was a very low trust society you know, in, within these tribes, because, you know, you couldn't, uh, if one, you couldn't just walk to another tribe, because then that tribe would think that this guy was coming to try to get intel, you know, as a spy, or he had some kind of shady motives, so they might just kick him out or, or you know, or kill him or whatever. And so it was this highly paranoid um, society that they had, but they hadn't progressed past that, um, that intertribal level warfare to any kind of higher, higher state, because primarily Turchin argues, they were, first of all, they all had, they all spoke similar languages or like similar dialects and they all had the same military technology. They were essentially like, like, uh, they were all the same. They were an island unto themselves. Yes, they were all the same. So there was nothing to really differentiate themselves. So there was no, what he calls cultural evolution because there was no, there were, there, there was no opportunity for these cultural traits to, to either, um, uh, well, to evolve, there was no opportunity for new cultural traits to emerge because everyone was just the, the same fighting with each other. Whereas in other parts of the world, like in, uh, you know, in areas of Europe or the, the Middle East, there were different groups who had different values, different, different histories, different state, you know, or different ideologies, different religions who would then, um, well, there was variation among the, among the groups that were doing, that were doing battle. So you had some that, some that uh, you know cropped up with new ideas, and they beat other that they defeated other people, and their ideas became became preeminent. And then there was this just 
you know, this kind of uh, musical chairs going on with these cultural values and ideas that w- that spread and achieved dominance at various times due to the nature of warfare. So, and even even Western Europe was a latecomer, you know, to to civilization. So during the you know the Roman Empire, um, well, the, the late Roman Republic and the you know early Roman Empire, of course, you have you know. Caesar and the people before him and after were going to, you know, Germania and, and Gaul and, and, uh, the British Isles. And this was still, they were still, you know, their, their polity size was still at the level of tribes and tribal alliances, you know, complex chiefdoms. And so at one point in the book, um, Turchin's trying to figure out what was the, what was the impetus for the first archaic states? Because, because even if, even if tribal societies were violent, um, they were still very egal- relatively egalitarian in nature, not fully egalitarian because, you know, um, it's not the way human nature is, but like with regard to food, there was food egalitarianism, for instance, and, um, and this need for cooperation. But then you get the first archaic states like Hawaii. Um, well, Hawaii was a later archaic state, but you get the first archaic states, which are just extremely unequal, like probably the most inequitable, violent and um, like despotic um, regimes known to human history. So these, this was the era of the God Kings where the, the state was ruled by a, a literal God King, um, who, who upheld the, the cosmic order by his very being. So, you know, I kind of, kind of imagine the, the dude from Stargate, you know, the alien Egyptian dude. And, <clears throat> and so the common feature among archaic states was like, like mass slavery, um, the, like just, you know, all, all the commoners were essentially slaves for the, the, the small religious military ruling class led by the God King. So the, the commoners did all the work and the, the elite got everything. And there was widespread human sacrifice, torture. So like when the God King was walking down the, you know, down his, um, you know, the, the central, uh, the central walkway of the the city. If you didn't genuflect and like, you know, bow your head, then if, if you were, uh, you know, a bit too late doing so, then you might be executed on the spot. And, and then of course, then of course the, you know, the human sacrifice, that's uh, always a fun thing. So it was actually a, a common feature among archaic states, you know, to have widespread human sacrifice. So how did this, how did this happen? And so Turchin's kind of trying to hypothesize, kind of trying to come up with ideas. Well, you can kind of look for, you can look at similar situations that must have happened in more recent times. So for instance, well, how did, how did these Germanic tribes become a state? And he goes through some examples from uh, like the first century of the, well, maybe it was even, maybe it was even with Caesar, but these, you know, so around the, the turn of the first millennium where you had these, um, these German warlords who like united a bunch of the, of the German tribes and then tried to establish themselves as Kings, but then, you know, got assassinated, you know, their a brother might've, one of their brothers might've assassinated them or, you know, some other tribe is like, no, we can't, this, this guy's turning into a, a dictator. We're going to take him out. And so for hundreds of years, it, it, it was like that. And then, and then eventually at some time, um, you know, I, I can't remember if it was the Carol, Carolingians, the Merovingians, but eventually, there was this, uh, you know, this a state was established, and it had a. It wasn't. It didn't. It wasn't exactly an archaic state, as as far as I know. I'd have to look in my, you know, my history of that time isn't great, but but similar features. You had now the the uh, the divine right of kings, and you had this like these supernatural, if not supernatural beings in the form of the king, then kings that had, um, you know, supernatural origins, and so you had this this very, if if it wasn't. It, if it wasn't an archaic state in the you know precise sense t- sense of the term, then it definitely rhymed. You know, it had these similar features, and also it's it's not it's not a perfect analogy because, um, like uh, the the Western European polities were living on the edge of an existing empire. Um, the first nation states were, you know, they were the 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 epitomes of civilization at the time. So slightly different, but something must have happened, like. Um, you have this. You have these growth. This growth of military alliances facing facing off with, um, you know, formidable enemies, and then at some point, 
the the combination of military and political power um, through some sh- some shady use of you know like Machiavellian um, like impression management, kind of like was used by Augustus to start the Roman Empire or to yeah. Uh, in name, um, that this, uh, a coup essentially took place. So Turchin argues that archaic states took place through military religious coups, where there was, there were the existing religious, um, institutions and well, religious and military institutions and norms to provide a legitimation of the, the, the transfer of power into the hands of like the God King. And that because but prior to the existence of the archaic states, prior to the emergence of the archaic states, humans had been very good at preventing any upstarts, like with the example of the the Germanic, you know, um, you know, warlords who who formed these military alliances and tried to become uh, tried to become king in those times. Um, so that's maybe how the archaic states started, um, but. I want to know if anyone else has anything to say. <laughs> well, so uh, a couple of things. One, I don't think uh, Turchin advocates war. No, uh, that's something he, he qualifies in his writing. Yeah. He's, not, he's not a proponent of uh, an organized warfare state as a, <clears throat> as a means to co- warfare. for increased cooperation among people. He just notices that that is one of the one of the leading factors in uh, in creating a highly cooperative and complex uh, society. And it's no longer the driver, he argues. And it's, and it's no longer the drive. Or primary driver. Okay. Um, one thing I was thinking about uh, as I was reading bits of this uh, was a movie, and I'm going to give a spoiler, Adam. So, uh, <laughs> you, spoiler you, alert. You, Close you, your ears. You, you don't have to say kids, it. Hide your wives. <laughs> but, but it was very illustrative to me of some of the... Uh, the, the impetus in, uh, in a lot of these um, larger uh, archaic states in, in becoming uh, nation states and becoming these larger, better organized, more cooperative nations. And the movie was called Hero, which on the surface is a very beautiful martial arts uh, historical drama uh, set in Chinese, the, right? Ch- yeah, Chinese film by uh, Zhang Yu probably not pronouncing that correctly, but um, beautiful film. And uh, basically the premise of it was, uh, you know, that the, 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 the king's, the uh, Qin state, as it was called in ancient China, 220s BC, um, had a, a kind of what was largely considered a despotic ruler who was attacking all of these other six states. And so you had the hero of the story uh, committed to uh, assassinating the king, the leader, um, in spectacular martial arts fashion. Uh, and, and we finally learn at the end of the film, in, conf- in confrontation with this king, that it was his dream and his, uh, his overall ambition not to kill people, uh, which he felt he was compelled to do, um, in these other six states, but that he wanted to unify all of his, all of the, the uh, six states within his leadership so that there could be this greater level of cooperation, so that there could be this uh, advancement in what he felt was a, uh, essentially all the same people, uh, but who had chosen to see themselves divided. So, um, you know, not being part of a warring culture or responsible for millions of people, you know, th- there is, to my mind, the question of, well, do the, do the ends justify the means? You're going to have thousands of people killed from other, uh, other neighboring states who want to uh, keep separate from you. And then you have this vision of this ultimate cooperation. And he had a huge army under him. And so... Um, I think I think a lot of this is uh, Turchin giving us very different frameworks from which to understand uh, what does he call it a macro social telescope or or lens, mm-hmm. but by which to look at how 
uh, large numbers of people have um, have warred only to become more cooperative at a later time and only to ultimately uh, stem off uh, death to a certain degree. Now, he talks about the, the dark side of cooperation also. Um, none dare call it a conspiracy. Uh, I haven't gotten to that point yet. So uh, there probably is um, ways in which these gigantic nation states that have reached on on some level a, a large uh, amount of cooperation and specialization um, also uh, take life uh, from other areas of, of the world and through exploitation and, and other things. Uh, so I imagine, given his uh, deep thinking on the subject, that he, he does touch upon these things. And like he says um, in certain places, this isn't the complete theory of everything. It can't be. It's not the total truth of, of how uh, this uh, cultural evolution, not to be confused with cultural revolution, um, exists. Um, but I would appreciate if, if anyone has gotten to that point, a, a kind of... Um, Explanation. I don't know if you you've reached that area yet of of what the dark side of uh, cooperation may be, uh, because you know while you do have this incredible level of cooperation among a uh, a large nation state that's been able to form a military and defend itself from from other uh, nation states, essentially, uh, there is still a I think a level of um, intra level. Uh, competition or covert exploitation that may not look like or sound like or be described as warfare, but is a kind of uh, economic and energy and resource war that um, that feeds uh, th this cooperative state. And that maybe on one level is a cooperative state and in another is imperial and is uh, is is for lack of a better word, uh, you know, covertly um, malevolent. Uh, well, I don't remember. Is that where? Where did you hear read about the dark side of cooperation? Uh, it doesn't in, stick out in my in my brain thoughts. In, in the intro, I think he mentions that he uh, he would get into that. But okay, well, he probably does talk about it. I don't. It doesn't really stick it out. Doesn't stick out as a main point. But well, I'll, I'll say something about it. But first, about that movie, about the movie Hero. If it was two mm. twenties BC, yeah. then it was that, then that must have been about the establishment of the Han Dynasty. Yes. So yeah. So that was the that's the empire that I mentioned, and um, that came about around the you know in the similar time period as the the Persian and the the one I forgot to mention was the the Mauryan Empire in India. So. These empires cropped up, you know, around the same time, and I, th I and I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, so it might have, it might not have been in the movie, but Turchin, well, I won't get in, you know, I no, I won't, I won't speculate. I don't know what he he doesn't talk specifically about the Han Dynasty, so um, it may there may have been some some um, influence of the, <clears throat> you know, like the Mongols, the uh, or maybe not were they Mongols at that time. Were they, is that what they were called? Well, the steppe, you know, steppe warriors in, in uh, Eastern Central Asia or Mongolian region, but I don't know. But on the nature of, because I'd mentioned that right as you were, uh, right at the beginning of what you were talking about, that he says it's no longer warfare that's the primary driver, because he does say that, that warfare has turned into, um, like the, the military t or, or warfare competition has turned into economic competition. And that that's the primary driver these days, you know, in the last hundred years or so. Um, but, but yeah, I can't remember, I can't remember specifically what he talks about as the, the dark side of cooperation. It might, it might be, um, it might have something to do with that. I can't remember what he thinks. Yeah, I'm trying to remember too, because I, I remember him coming off uh, a bit about that in the first uh, or maybe the second chapter. Um, but it was never anything that stuck out 
or it wasn't something that kind of like stuck out in my mind as like what I was conceptualizing in terms of a dark side of, of cooperation. Um, I guess it would be it. And I may be getting this wrong. Um, but I think it was more along the lines of it, it provides an opportunity. Like once you have a, a certain like group established, uh, for what he calls like freeloaders to insinuate themselves and then kind of uh, pathologize uh, a certain group in order to, you know, reach their own ends and means that kind of subverts the, the cooperative ethos of the, yeah. of the body politic. Yeah, that sounds um, right. That's, that would be, if I'm remembering correctly, and again, I might not be, but I, I'm pretty sure that was kind of how I, how he approached it in terms of the dark side of cooperation is that like, yes, cooperation is good and it allows for all of these great things, but it also then allows for the, the kind of, uh, the, sh the wolves and sheep's clothing to kind of, you know, insinuate themselves into, into areas and, uh, into positions of power that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to reach. Um, so like kind of what you were saying where the, there's the question of what, um, you know, what, is it right or wrong for somebody to kind of have that hero's uh, ethos to unify a group when it involves so much suffering? But at the same time, too, it's like they were going to suffer. There was, you know, six tribes and they're all fighting each other all the time. Well, that's whether you go in to try and assert yourself so that there's a cohesion between all of them or not. Mm -hmm. That's that's the state of things. So that everyone's already suffering. So you're actually doing everybody a favor by you know i'm doing you a favor <laughs> yeah. you will not, thank me for this <laughs> not not to mention any outside uh enemies or militaries that that might be able to pick off those individual states precisely because they're not unified with the other states and and it's that sort of thinking uh among people who have that vision which is interesting to me because naturally we don't we don't have those considerations <laughs> um so uh, yeah. Luke, what were you going to say? Yeah. Um, no, I, I wanted to, cause I haven't read the book, uh, uh, yet. Um, and, uh, just read a few things about it. Um, but from what I gather is that, uh, Turchin also goes a bit into, you know, the whole, um, ideology, religion kind of aspect of it. And I just wanted to ask, um, you know, uh, if you guys have, have something to say about that, because um, uh, obviously like this, this is kind of like another school of thought about history, right? To kind of um, uh, start with the, with the ideas and all of that, or, or at least um, have that uh, a major feature of, of cultural evolution, um, you know, what kind of ideas people had and what kind of religion philosophy and all that and uh, i was just wondering because um i think that there is um there's a tendency to basically in 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 this kind of evolutionary thinking to um to say that these cultural things like um religion um ideas and that sort of thing are more like a, co a consequence of let's say certain pressures or certain survival pressures or maybe um, the need for, you know, for the God King to consolidate his power. Um, but uh, I was just thinking that there is, um, that, that the, the realm of ideas got to play a part in it, right? Because I mean, we have the, all these myths that go way back. Um, and uh, it's not that the, the idea of good and evil you know, was just a recent uh, thing, right? <laughs> so, um, and uh, and there there must be some. I mean, if we imagine these these kinds of tribes or later like archaic states, um, uh, there there is. Um, I mean, th there are different motivations, right, for conquest. So you have this ar archetypal ar archetypical um, like psychopathic, you know, god king leader kind of thing um but you also have like the, the the wise um the wise leader um that uh that you know everyone is happy with and um he might be strong and 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 as well but uh but also you know like st kind of stands on the on the good side of things and and uh, and people flock to him or he can like gather like 
uh, bigger command, you know, bigger armies because he, he's representing something and it can go both ways, obviously, right? I mean, you can also have like a, uh, the, the archetypal, typical psychopathic leader who uh, kind of coerces people or like uh, sweet talks them into like worshiping him or whatever. But you have this whole realm of, um, of ideas, you know, of, of, of instinct, of uh, religious thinking of good versus evil. And you can easily imagine um, that people even way back uh, struggled with some of the same things that we all struggle with, right? In terms of um, how to live a life and, and what's good, what's bad and, and all that. So I was just wondering um, whether he, what he has to say about, about all of that. Yeah. If you, he, if you know. Yeah. He, he does talk about that. I'd say that uh, just overall, he's probably, you probably characterized him pretty well in your description of like the, the cultural evolutionists that, uh, that he sees the, the ideology more as a, you know, more downstream from the, the driving factors because, uh, well, I'll get into a paper that he wrote after this book, because there's a section in the book where he talks about the, the so-called axial age. So the axial age was this idea. It's been around for a while, but it was primary. It was, it was popularized and developed most prominently by, I believe it was Carl Jaspers. And this idea that there was this axial age in the the mid first century BC, which saw the rise of you know, Buddhism, Confucianism, um, Taoism, um, Judaism, um, Greek philosophy, so Socratism and Platonism, and that these there was there were these similar ideas that cropped up at you know approximately the same time, and that these these new religions, these new ideologies. Um, <clears throat> were, well, I think for Jaspers, they might, they were more of a driver of, of the new empires. Um, and then when Turchin's talking about them in the book, he sees them as kind of the, the, the perfect ideologies for these new large scale multi-ethnic empires where th there were new ideals that were introduced by a lot of these thinkers that were, that had more of a, a universalizing tendency so that it was no longer, um, these, tribal specific beliefs for the most part. Um, like, uh, so, so my God, my people, it was more of uh, a universal God and anyone could join. They were the proselytizing religions. So anyone could, could join the religion. It didn't matter what part of the empire you were from, you could all share the same religion and es essentially establish a, a huge multi-ethnic tribe of people from different backgrounds, speaking different, different languages or coming from different languages. And, you could establish it was kind of the glue that held to, or that these these religions and ideologies were the glue that held together these large scale these new mega empires. So that's how he presents it in the book. And um, well, I'll, I'll say more about um, about archaic states and like and ideas before then too. So the pre archaic state um, like uh, religions and and beliefs. But on this for a moment, in that paper, that he he and his colleagues did a. Uh, did a study after this book on the axial age um, religions and well axial age in, in general and try to figure out what was going on there um, basically testing some of the ideas about the theory because the main the main idea of the theory was was that it was defined in time you know this was a, a an age a specific age in history in the in the first millennium BC when all these things happened and what he found what they did is they they took the like the five to seven regions where um, all the axial age theorists, um, you know, place or or all the or the seven that axial age theorists in various combinations will will see the axial age in in action, and then they took some like um, uh, like control samples of regions that are never talked about in relation to the axial age and and identified all of the features, all the axial features that all the axial theorists talk about, and then just looked at all the data they had for these like I think it was fourteen regions and and to to see w when these axial um, beliefs and practices were put into place and were you know widespread within these cultures. and they they found that the axial age, kind of, in a sense, it didn't exist. Um, and in a sense, it kind of did. But for instance, you found, or, or they found axial um, stuff going on in Turkey um, that no, none of the axial proponents had 
hypothesized or or acknowledged. And then you had, um, well, th their main conclusion was that there was no axial age, but there were there was there was um, what they called like axiality, that there were axial traits that seemed to be um, seemed to be more a function of the the size and complexity of 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 a society. So when societies got to a certain um, level of complexity and 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 size, then you saw these elements of axiality um, within those cultures, and so the the way he puts it is that you might have these unique and remarkable you know individuals and thinkers you know like uh, like Buddha and and or Siddhartha Gautama and and um, and Confucius and Lao Tzu or Lao Tzu and um, and Zoroaster and all these guys, and they leave a mark on history. But it, but oftentimes, like with Buddhism, it might be centuries before the ideas actually gain any traction. And so I think he he kind of combines them in a sense that you know you might have you might have Buddha, you know, um, with this revolutionary new uh, new way of thinking about things and doing things which might be influenced still by by trends that are you know in the environment at that time but which don't end up having an influence for for generations you know later it was um he gives the example of i think it was ashoka uh, not ashoka tano just Ash a king ashoka in in india um who implemented a lot of the buddhist ideas and he he became like the first you know good uh good indian king you know, around or emperor, I can't remember emperor around this time, and implementing like the the Buddhist principles. But um, but he is more definitely more of that kind of structural uh, type of guy. But relating to the uh, to like the archaic states, for instance, he points out that there are um, like from Hawaii there are songs from the commoners in Hawaii and various other archaic states for which we have, um, you know, ethnographic data. Um, so the songs that the commoners would sing and they'd be like, oh, the leaders are snakes and they devour us. And, uh, you know, they're, you know, they, they were not happy with their, with their lot. It's not like they worshiped and loved the, the, the ruling elite and thought that they were, you know, that they were totally justified in being there. But on the, on the other hand, they had internalized the, the, the religious ideology to the extent that they probably did think that the, the world would fall apart if the king were, you know, deposed and the, and the system were, were shaken up, um, that probably would be cataclysmic. So there was this kind of like love hate relationship in the sense that, oh, well, we have to live with this evil king. Um, but we, we hate these guys and, uh, and we're going to sing songs about them, you know, calling them evil snakes that devour the, the, the commoners. Um, but at the same time, like you said, there is that, there is that instinctual level of, and people that would, would, they would recognize, you know, if a good leader came onto the scene, right. They'd be like, Oh, thank God. We were, we were dealing with these psychos for, for generations. Now we have someone we can actually get behind. And that probably also goes back to the trends that were established in the, the tribal societies where, um, there were certain features, um, you know, for a good leader, the, the way to gain prominence in the, in the tribal societies wasn't to be necessarily a good hunter because you could be a good hunter, but if you started, if you started getting too full of yourself, then they'd, then they'd start making fun of you. And you'd have to, you'd have to get your act in order before you, you know, they stopped making fun of you, uh, you know, your, your, your fellow hunt, hunters and fellow tribes, people, tribesmen. And, but the way to, there was a level of, you know, there was a reputation. So you had to be a good person and you had to be, you had to have good features or, you know, you had to have certain features to be, recognized as as worthy of um, emulation and respect and those were arguably or, or you know i'd argue kind of some of those those universal universal heroic features that self-sacrificing nature um you know probably probably generosity um fairness you know things like that it wasn't just early these early human tribes they weren't like a um you know alpha male you know, chimpanzee, uh, troops, they were, you know, they were human societies. So the alpha males, um, you know, if you were an alpha male, then you wouldn't have an easy time with it because, you know, everyone else would just gang up on you and, oh, this is the thing we haven't mentioned yet. Uh, just incidentally might come back to it in a bit. Is it the, the primary 
like the the primary thing about military technology um, or the the biggest weapons technology developments were in projectile weapons. And so this is something that Turchin comes back repeatedly throughout the book, and he argues that projectile weapons, just like there's the saying that God created men and Sam Colt made men equal, um, that was true of of the bow and arrow, well, and even the the thrown stone, um, because chimpanzees, for instance, they'll you know they'll tear each other up, you know all the all the like chimps and apes and all all those guys, they'll they'll t- tear each other up, but it's hand to hand combat for the most part. When when humans first realized you could use a stone to to incapacitate and potentially kill someone from a distance, then the alpha lost any kind of advantage he had over everyone else, because you know an alpha chimp can dominate, or you know an al- an alpha ape you know can dominate a whole bunch of people or people not <laughs> other 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 monkeys. Um, but a human can't do that because as soon as he starts getting too big for his britches and tar- starts bossing people around, then you're going to get, all you need is one person to to pick up the first stone and take him out. Or you get a group of people who are like, we're not taking it. We're not putting up with this anymore. He could beat any one of us, you know, in hand to hand combat. But all we have to do is either all pick up a stone and, and stone him or all pick up a spear and poke him at a distance until he's dead. Or um, once the bow and arrow was developed, then all you needed to be do- all you needed was to be a good archer, and the the advantage of physical strength was extremely extremely mitigated among human groups, and that just progressed over time. So the, when when I talked about the step warriors, they were um, mobile archers. So not only could they could they shoot you with an arrow, but they could that they had mo- uh, the advantage of mobility to be uh, you know to be able to ride on horseback. And, but, um, that aside, back to the, this ideology thing. So I think that there are, um, to, to, to try to like, if, if these two perspectives can kind of be reconciled, you have this kind of, these kind of universal, you know, universal ideals and and values, I think that can probably you can probably find instantiations or manifestations of them throughout all of human history, even in the archaic states, um, represented through the the disaffection and the dissatisfaction with the with the rulers. Um, but then there are probably sp- specific. Well, there are culturally contingent elements of certain ideologies that will probably only develop and take root, because that's the important part, is these ideas actually taking root. They can probably develop at any time, but if there's not the the fertile ground, you know, for them to take root in, then they'll just die out. So you could have like a, you know, um, you know, an early, an early Buddha who's, who's in this, you know, archaic state who just, you know, he, he just can't get a following and we've forgotten about him because he, he died with no followers. And, um, but then as you have, societies grow and develop in new in new ways um, like with the rise of po- of populations and complexity then you have um, the opportunity for these new ideas to arise and that's so that's where you get these innovators that that come forward and again you can have a ton of innovators who who we don't even remember because their ideas didn't catch on either they were ahead of their time or or whatever and and then in so so it was in those mega empires that that all of these axial age religions and ideologies actually managed managed to take root to the point where they became the the fabric of of our you know cultural history um well and and the cultural histories of the various regions so so you know Confuci- confucianism um forms the bedrock of east asian civilization um and and then and Buddhism, you know, had spread from India to to the Asias, uh, well, South Asia, South Asia to the, the Eastern and, and Southeast Asian, um, you know, centers of of civilization, and um, and then similar similarly with Christianity in the West. So we've we're we're kind of living in in what the what I think Turchin calls like the post axial age where a lot of these axial ideas and practices that were developed over the last 2000 years have become, um, you know, just have become part of our, part of the fabric of, of our, uh, societies and our cultures. And, um, I think that's, I think that's all I had to say about that. Does that, is that a satisfying response, Luke, 
or, or, or do yeah, you very, very much so. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'll I'll jump in here then because um, there were some some bits that I wanted to add in as well. Um, at one point, uh, Turchin writes that uh, you know at some point along when these uh, uh, archaic states started to form, they evolved uh, means of uh, internal suppression or cohesion, um, which I don't like that that way of describing what it is because. I mean, it seems to me like if you are a burgeoning uh, archaic state, it's not like there's some kind of like thing floating around that's saying, hey, you need, you need to do this. It's more like, <clears throat> okay, we have a bunch of people. How do we get them to kind of all be on the same page in terms of like supporting us? And uh, how do we get them <laughs> to remember that they yeah. need us? Yeah. Basically, how do we tell them or make them think that they need us. Uh, so that's kind of, uh, I think that's a better way of looking at it than just kind of like hand waving. Oh, they evolved mechanisms for, uh, internal cohesion and suppression. Um, it's, I think this is where it gets more, more well thought out to where, um, you know, kind of like how the, the development of the Roman empire, they just kind of like it burst on the scene with its own, with its own mythos, and its own kind of like story and religion, um, all kind of, you know, based within the cultures of the area at the time, but kind of like formed into cohesive unit that can create a story and a narrative that would allow for uh, all of the things that came after uh, to follow. Um, but, but then something that you said, and so that kind of like takes uh, Plato and how he described how to set up a, a perfect state um, where like the, the Jewish religion, like th they followed a very specific plan um, in doing some of that. And I think you might be able to argue that even prior to Plato, uh, people would be able to intuit some of this, um, not to a, you know, a very large degree or anything, but they might be able to intuit some, some inklings and bits and pieces. I mean, like the God King is an example, like you have a, a compelling story for why you're important and why the, the unit exists and, and so on. So I think that's, that's an aspect of it too, but there's, yeah, there's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting aspect of, um, Turchin's book as, com as compared to what you were saying about the people who created this idea of the axial age, um, which is that some of the people that Turchin writes about and, and uh, compares his theories and ideas to is the fact that the people that come from this, this standpoint, and you mentioned somebody else, and I can't remember their name either, where they were like, there's the barbarian stage, and then there's this other stage, and then there's civilization. Like those all have kind of like two features to them. One of it is like a, it's a teleological, um, look at history where everything's progressing. Uh, and then the other aspect of it is that it's always modern centric. So it's like, we are the perfection. And so everything was just like, it's rewriting history in order to, 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 to reinforce your current belief that, you know, where you exist is the best that could, uh, that does exist. Um, so that's kind of like a, a feature of a lot of those kind of historians, whereas Turchin, um, doesn't have any of that, like you said before, where this is just, this is just about, you know, population sizes and the, the sheer number of people working together. And, and these can all kind of like, uh, ebb and flow to, to where, uh, you know, any one nation need not always be the same nation, um, or any one, you know, uh, empire need be the same empire you know, empires rise and fall and nations rise and fall too. And so this is this theory, uh, his way of thinking about things allows for that kind of process and doesn't judge, uh, anything as being like morally right or morally wrong. Um, it just kind of like, it's just prediction. And, and that's the other thing is that you can actually like predict certain things. And so that makes it a very useful tool. So, um, those are just some other aspects of, uh, I, th I think both your question and, and Turchin's work that I think were, were worth bringing up. If you had something else that you wanted to say, Luke. 
Yeah, no, I, I was just because uh, you said something interesting um, about uh, uh, you know Plato and the whole idea that um, uh, there's a model to um, for, for kind of like a religion that you can use to create your your state and uh, hold it together, kind of thing. And and Harris, you, you, I thought it was also interesting how you put it um, that maybe it's a combination of these two things that sometimes you know people come up with with uh, ideas or interesting concepts and maybe only later on it it takes on and it's put in the political context. And I was just you know for these two aspects, I, I was just thinking about maybe a more recent example uh, with the whole enlightenment thing, maybe you can uh, see it in that way as well. Um, so that uh, those all these enlightenment thinkers came to the scene, maybe because the, the time was ripe and, and it was um, just uh, what they developed. But it, it was actually only later that this got political traction. So um, the, the, the U S um, Uh, constitution and all that that was you know that was at least a hundred years um afterwards so it was a whole process and uh and it was then that you know certain historical um uh, uh circumstances and also certain um needs um of those who founded the, the u.s and uh arose and so th that made the these kinds of concepts uh very fruitful um so so i thought that that's maybe an analogy to think of, uh, in terms of more recent history um how how these that we actually know better right or or maybe we can can a bit uh, identify a bit better with um to see how how these kinds of things might might work out um and and so now you know with the enlightenment thing you could also argue um that it over the centuries there was a whole like ideology spun around that that actually um was then used as a really as a state religion basically right um and to the point where nowadays um it's freedom and democracy that you know you spread around the world um as an empire basically so uh it, it's kind of it's kind of interesting maybe to 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 see that way or for me maybe that it makes it makes kind of sense what you guys were saying and mm -hmm. well it just just that reminded me in off in a in a random way of just one thing i wanted to comment about the archaic states um and that was that once once new and better competitors came onto the scene they didn't stand a chance right so so once the mega empires came then there were if you were an archaic state living on you know within within reach of a mega empire um you know you were toast because and one of the reasons that turchin gave was that well the 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 relative egalitarianism of the mega empires meant that you could recruit a lot of troops whereas if the the, the highly um like hierarchical and like slave structure of the archaic states well if you gave probably if you if you uh um if if you gave all the commoners weapons well they might just go after the you know the elites and take them out on their own so there there wasn't really the structure there was no way that archaic states could compete with the mega empires um just based on size and those kind of factors alone so so thankfully the 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 mega empires kind of you know disappeared relatively quickly and but i'm still interested in like one research project i want to do if if there if i can ever find the data available or i, I hope ideally someone else has done it is to look at the the emergence of like the first states in various regions throughout time because of course you had the you know the the, the big ones the main ones that 5,000 years ago in like mesopotamia but i want to see stuff about what societies were like when they achieved that level of like the archaic state so like in the the early the early western european states and then i want or or anywhere in in asia or in africa and just see how many similarities they have with the like the the primary archaic states um because i know that one thing that stood out for me was that 
talking about human sacrifice and how the, I think the last, one of the last main regions to, to regularly practice human sacrifice was in Scandinavia. And it only really, um, only really phased out in like, well, relatively recently in like the last several hundred years. Um, so I, I hadn't really thought about that, but, uh, but that was pretty interesting. We saw a little bit of that in the, in the Northmen, the human sacrifice, but, uh, but yeah, so those Northern Europeans, I mean, they, they might be nice and, and chill, but they, they were sacrificing each other until relatively recently. <laughs> They're going around sacrificing everybody. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to make a quick comment, Harrison, because you have a, a new article about this book on your Substack, right? Uh -huh. And what is the name of it again? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, in, gonna... in the margins. It's just, it's really simple. In I think it's called In the Margins, uh, Ultra Society by Peter Turchin. Yeah. So we're going to post a link to that uh, in the uh, show description for the week. And um, what came of that was uh, another uh, Substack blogger, uh, John Carter, who responded to your your entry and um his uh the title of his article was how weaponry organizes society so he gets um uh he gets rather heavy into how um societies have been uh like you were describing earlier uh better um better armed through technology uh and and traces how um war technology has evolved uh, over the past few thousand years and what it's enabled various um, archaic states turned um, nation states, what, what it's enabled them to do. And um, what I liked about his piece was that he kind of brings us uh, up to date right now. He, he looks at um, where uh, the United States and the West in general as a, uh, as a kind of, um, uh, nation state and, and that's influencing a number of other nation states where, uh, is cu cultural evolution is going. And, um, and what he says is kind, kind of interesting. Um, because although he doesn't, use the totalitarian word, uh, he mentions that the World Economic Forum and, and its influence and the kind, of, uh, um, the kind of softening of Western critical faculties among its population, as, as we've been uh, discussing here on the show for quite some time, has, has made uh, the US less effective as a nation state um, in that it hasn't been producing uh, people that would be worthy soldiers who uh, who are thinking people, at least not to the degree that um, that he would consider optimal for for uh, for this nation state. And um, the conclusion he comes to is that in a war against another nation state that would have a unity of purpose that has been, uh, weaning and educating and nurturing its population uh, to be purposeful, physically fit, mentally fit, intellectually fit individuals, that uh, they have uh, an advantage in a way that um, may be unanticipated or, or underestimated by a large number of people in the West. So I enjoyed uh, seeing how Turchin's ideas and, and your blog post in particular have have extended the conversation about what it is we're seeing and and all of these metrics for describing what is a um, what is a successful nation state and why. Yeah, John Carter. I was I was going to mention his article too. Um, John Carter from Mars, I believe, but uh, he's soon. <laughs> <laughs> no from Mars. <laughs> um, He's got, uh, well, he's, he's really funny. He's a, he's a good writer and he's got some, uh, even his image descriptions are very entertaining. Um, oh, now I'm just thinking of his jokes. What was I going to say about him? Um, okay. Yeah. So one of the points that he makes, he brings into, he brings a, uh, a, a kind of different idea, uh, centralization and decentralization. Now Turchin kind of talks about this just in the sense of, um, 
of inequality. Um, so highly unequal states like the archaic states and then highly equals, um, equals or highly egalitarian relatively, um, which he would characterize as like the, uh, modern states or, um, uh, what's the, I'll show the diagram that he, one of his criticisms of Steven Pinker is that Pinker kind of hypothesizes this, this linear, like lots of violence to little violence. And, oh, and then we have the enlightenment in there that, that really made things great. And um, Turchin's like, nah, it's not that simple. So he's got this, which he, which was inspired by someone else, but, oh, how do I get that in there? It's a Z shape. Now we might get uh, banned for including that shape on this, uh, on this YouTube video, but what it's showing is the, the high inequality in like ancestral primate groups, and then the early foraging bonds you know, early tribes, early human tribes, very egalitarian, extremely unequal archaic states, even more unequal than um, like uh, chimp or ape societies. And then back to um, constitutional democracies, which are vastly more, uh, well, they're more, more equal than ancestral primate groups, but not quite as equal as the early foraging bonds. So, um, so he has that. And then so in really, so what John Carter writes about, just like I quoted that, that saying about Sam Colt making everyone equal. Well, so the, the, the first thrown stone made pe people equal. The first bow and arrow made people equal. The, the first spear thrower, the athlatl. Um, then, but one of the points that he makes is he, he talks about the, the kind of resources that go into certain weapons technologies. So when when you're uh, when you were living in this early tribe, your job was to go out in the forest, get some pieces of wood, you know, put together a, a bow, learn how to shoot it, and then then you, you could be a you know a warrior or a hunter. It's like yeah, that's a, that's a great way to spend your free time. Um, you know, the, the, their work was our uh, past or our you know recreation, <laughs> and but it was it was relatively equal because it was really because it was easy to do. But then you got to the point of like medieval societies where where to have like the upkeep for uh, a knight with all of his armor and his and his horse and you know all the people all the people that need to go in to support that um are like an entire village to have one knight whereas you know some tribe some tribal guy could just go out go out and make himself a bow and arrow and there's a similar dynamic that's played out where where today it's like not everyone can have a uh an apache helicopter or yeah, nuclear weapon. These these are and he he quotes the just, just some of the the numbers, right? It costs like however many dozens of millions of dollars to make like an F thirty five or or an F twenty two or something, and then and then how many household incomes it takes to to first of all build a fighter jet, and then it takes like a year or or half a year of a family income to fly one mission because the, the upkeep on these things is like, you know, millions of dollars for every mission that they fly. So that has, that has put military technology or just, just, uh, yeah, military technology out of the hands of the ordinary individual. Whereas, you know, where Sam Colt really did make you equal when, when the, the level of, of weapons technology was a gun, anyone could have a gun and, and, um, and everyone was equal in that sense. But now with military technologies, only states can have, um, that level of military technology. But he says the, the new revolution he's, he predicts is going to be drone, uh, drone warfare. And so this will re-equalize military technology again with these quadrocopters. You can have a cheap, a cheap quadrocopter. That's what they're called, right? Drone that you can, that, that can be improvised. You know, you can put a, an improvised explosive on it and anyone can do it. And you see this happening in, like you saw this happening in Syria, and, pro and I think Iraq too, and <clears throat> we'll probably see it happening in uh, in Ukraine, and but and that and that's the thing is that it's it's cheap and easy, just like a bow and arrow was. And it, uh, I think uh, Carter's like a he seems like a I think he's got a background in the military, so um, and and so he's looking at it from this from this you know almost from the inside and these types of technologies can be very effective on the battlefield. And there's like, at present, there's not a lot of um, defense against them. Like uh, you just fly in this tiny drone and it can take out a, you know, 
you can find the weak spot in the tank or yeah and because it, because it, it's not only uh like a mobile like effective weapon but it's also got a camera on it so at the same time it's, it's a targeting system yeah it's got a targeting system it's got you know um recon capability and high mobility it can get in it, it's relatively small and undetectable um so th that's the direction at least that's kind of how his prediction for the you know future military technology developments which i thought was interesting so but yeah i'll, I'll include a link because he's fun to read any uh anything else i think that's everything i wanted to talk about in relation to the book um but did you guys have any final thoughts no nothing okay well and i think i'll Not end really. it. i think i'll end it there well oh maybe one last one last thing maybe as a preview for the book you'd mentioned that you'd you just finished the chapter on sports right so that he he talks about co cooperation and competition and there's a, a really interesting um well, he, he talks about sports teams and the nature of cooperation on sports teams and, and inter-team competition and intra-team competition. Basically, if you ha just like with hunting and with warfare, if you have a team that can't cooperate well with each other, uh, your team is not going to be very good. If, if, if each person on the team is just out for themselves and wants to be the big star, you're not going to have a very good team. And... Uh, You'll have this in memory better than I will, but what what sport was it that the study was done on? Was it soccer? Was it basketball? Uh, the, they did a few where it was. Uh, they had the they were looking at the the soccer teams in Italy, where they had like the three uh, different kind of like levels of soccer soccer teams. Um, there was also some basketball research that they did, and then also baseball. Okay, so it was the three. Yeah, I mean, what, things, what they basically find is that if you have, well, the level of unequal pay among teams is like the primary, like there's a linear relationship between the inequality of pay for team members and the success of the team. So if you're high, if you have like the, your one big star that you pay tens of millions of dollars to and everyone else you're giving like essentially minimum sports wage, then your team's going to suck. And the more equal the pay is among all members, chances are like your team's going to be better. And it is a little, a linear relationship. So the most unequal teams are the worst and the most equal paid teams are the best. Like the, and that just seems to be the way it works. But he's like, you know, it's a simple idea, but you'd think that you'd think that the, all of the, um, like team owners and managers would actually look at the data and realize this because they all keep making the same mistake of, oh, we gotta, we gotta hire these, these great guys to, and pay them tons of money so that we can have a great team. Well, it's not going to work that way. It doesn't work that way. And he makes a, a good point about pointing out the fact that, uh, it seems to be more prevalent that you know, these kind of like business decisions, these poor mi business decisions uh, are more frequent within the American, the American oh, yeah. side of things uh -huh. and, and less uh, frequent on the European side, uh, just because it seems that the Americans are more likely to uh, focus on the hyper performance and the, uh, the individual over, yeah, over represent the influence of the individual rather than uh, looking at the the effect that the uh, the cooperation of the team well, is because Europeans are just a bunch of commies. <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> yeah. But you always realize have been, always will. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but for that sort of thing to work, it would have to be the entire sport, right? No, a absolutely. And the reason is because if you have a team that's managed and and they they pay everyone the same, but then you have another team that says, hey. Uh, player B, we're going to pay you a lot more than you would be paid on that team where you're because we we recognize your talent, but we're willing to pay you a lot more. So come here and and we'll pay you more. So he leaves to go where he's going to be better paid because that's that's what he may be motivated by. So in other words, it would have to be a uniform system throughout the entire sport for it to work, I think. no. Not not quite, um, 
because the team that gets the big player is still going to suck and the team without their good player is still going to be really good because they work well together. Mm -hmm. um, it would it would be better if everyone did it that way. It would be it would equal the living the le it would level the playing field. <laughs> it would equal the level field. <laughs> and uh, but but the dynamic would still be the same if there's disparity between the way teams are because that's the way things are. Um, yeah. That's, and uh, no, but yeah. it, you're right. I think you know it's it's like um, uh, in 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 football, as it's probably called, uh, not incorrectly. Soccer, <laughs> um, <laughs> European like original football. Um, <laughs> there, I mean, there's a phenomenon, um, you know, that that happens a lot. That you know, one team buys like a star player from like the team that kind of made him big or that he grew in right uh, for lots of money and then he he sucks you know and he's he just isn't that good anymore um in the new team so that, that's kind of like well-known thing or you know it doesn't work or whatever and and also you can see that um in in corporate life right in career and things like that so there's um this philosophy you know even though maybe someone else would pay me more you know i still stay with my original company because you know we're a good team i like the guys and it's good work and so on or you know like i i get paid more but uh, you hear that a lot then often it, it doesn't work out i mean maybe that's that's also a bit of a european commie thing as you <laughs> guys would would have it um you know, not, not to just you know switch companies all the time or like uh, chase after like the the highest pay and you know like one year here hire and fire and all that <laughs> yeah it's like the, the the total cliche but that that's how it is i i imagine in in america um no but uh, but seriously i mean this um um, yeah, this is an interesting thought that um, that this uh, you know it would be best uh, if if everything everyone uh, recognized this, this sort of thing, but there's still I, I suppose like a mechanism at play that kind of mitigates this um, this effect you know that that people just throw money um, and yeah so so I guess humanity has some some wisdom still in them. <laughs> Well, there's, uh, to your point, and I think Luke kind of like touched on it uh, with his examples. Um, I'm pretty sure if you did like go in for, for specific examples of what you're talking about, where, where a team that wasn't performing very well tried to snipe one of the better players, they're probably going to run into the same phenomenon that we were just talking about that is a pitfall of American business owners you to sports team owners where they overvalue an individual player and undervalue the work of the team. So when they do snipe the, you know, the star player, quote unquote, um, their team isn't going to perform any better. And the other teams probably going to perform just fine because it's not about the individual. It's about the, the, the player or the team's, you know, cohesion and, and cooperative uh, abilities as a, as a whole, mm -hmm. that would be, that would be my guess. Uh, anyways, but it would be good to have specific examples. Like I don't watch football. <laughs> so it's not a commie. <laughs> That's the reason we don't have football in America. <laughs> we only have the real football. <laughs> oh, okay. On that note. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good place. I think, How to, the hell uh, did we get there? Right? <laughs> All right. Uh, that was fun. So, book, Ultra Society, Peter Turchin. He's got, he's working on two new books at the present moment. So, I think one of them's coming out later this year and the other probably the year after. So, looking forward to those. We'll talk about them when they come out. And that said, we'll have links in the description. Like, subscribe, uh, share, share with your friends. You want to cooperate with your friends by sharing our show. And, uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. See you next week. Take care.